Friday. Welcome to our last Lunch and Learn. Today's topic is hair loss, which is really close to my heart. We'll talk about male and female hair loss and everything that can cause it and also what we can do to treat it. Before we begin, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to name um, our five winners from yesterday's Lunch and Learn on skin cancer. This is our birthday girl. This is Seema. Today is her birthday. She is going to to give our five winners here. Because okay. it's <laughs> we have Ann Garther, Miss Alice, Brenda Bryan, Crystal Meehan, and Charity Nelson. Yay! And then Yay. you want to um, mention and show them our kit. Kelsey, you want to show what everybody can get and how we can enter them in that drawing scene. Yeah, so this is our big anti-photo aging kit, which is awesome. If you have tuned in every single day this week and watched Dr. Treen and Kelsey and Mindy present, you are eligible to win this, which is valued at about $290, which is awesome. So just hashtag Tureen Dermatology in the comments, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram, if you've tuned in all five days and you're entering from this guy right here. And this has everything that we all use, vitamin C serum, retinol, um, sunscreen, moisturizer, so it's really your go-to simple kit. But just hashtag, like Seema said, Terrain Dermatology in your um, uh, comment for today, and we'll enter you and we'll um, post all the winners for the five winners from today and the big kit on Monday. So let's dive into hair loss because it is really a topic that affects so many people. I'm going to just go through a little bit about hair loss. We'll talk about the hair cycle and then we'll go into the causes. So um, let's begin with how many scalp hair follicles we have, how many we lose a day. So that's people get really concerned um, because they see you know, a lot of hair. But typically it's normal to lose anywhere between 50 to 150 hairs a day. So if you're darker haired like I am, often you see it a little bit more, but it is pretty typical to lose that amount of hair. On a normal human head, we have between 80 to 120,000 hair follicles. So really, you've got a lot to draw from. On a normal um, human head. Let's talk about the hair cycle. Kelsey, do you want to go into um, the hair cycle? So we'll talk about kind of the growth phases, and that'll help you understand what causes hair loss. So we all have multiple cycles that our hair grows or goes through. Um, the several of them, but the two main ones are a resting phase and an active growth phase. Um, so we're going to start right here in this corner. This is the antigen phase. This is the actually the active growth phase. This is where your hair grows longer um, as it's it's growing deep in the follicle. Um, the everybody's genetically programmed to have a different length of antigen. It can be anywhere from two to seven years. The longer your antigen phase is, the longer your hair can grow. Um, so we have lots of patients who are like, I've never been able to grow my hair past mm -hmm. my shoulders. You just happen to have a shorter antigen growth phase. Um, and then other people who can grow it, you know, to their knees have a really long one. Um, so as our hair um, grows long and long, eventually what happens is you enter what's called the catagen phase. This is where the hair follicle kind of comes off the very deep part, the nutrition part of the follicle, and it starts to pull forward into the, the deep follicle, the hole, essentially. Eventually, it goes into what's called the telogen phase. This is um, just a resting phase. It kind of hangs out in this follicle for a while. Um, and it's very common for, I think it's about 15% of your hair is in this telogen phase at any one time. And then as we, it, um, it comes around back to the antigen phase and during that time, um, it's technically called exogen, which makes sense because a new hair follicle will start to grow and push out the old hair. And this is that 50 to 150 hairs that get shed normally. You gotta get rid of the old stuff in order for new stuff to come in. So those are the you know kind of basic um, premise of how your hair grows. Um, hair loss can be so personal, but I do want you to know an interesting statistic. By the age of 60, it is estimated and studied that 85% of men will suffer from hair loss and up to 70% of women will suffer from hair loss. But it's not really talked about in women. Um, there's such a stigma in women to lose your hair. Um, in men, you know, it's somewhat accepted, but as women, it really can affect us. I want you guys to know that there's a significant history of hair loss in my family. My poor mom has, has really suffered from hair loss, and um, all my life I've kind of 
fear going in that direction. This past summer, I was really sick and I had um, what's called adrenal insufficiency. My adrenal gland, which is a gland that sits on top of my kidney, stopped working due to some autoimmune and hormonal factors. And I lost so much hair. I lost probably about 60 to 70% of my hair. And I just remember being so depressed and sad and scared. Every time I would comb my hair and all this gross hair would come out, it just, it really affects you and it affects how you see yourself and affects how you look at the world. So I want you all to know that there are things that can be done. If you do not suffer from hair loss, good for you, but you probably know somebody who does and you should let them know that there are things that can be done. They don't have to suffer alone. Um, and there are really certain things that we as dermatologists know, certain vitamins, supplements, nutritional things, different procedures. So we'll talk about all that because it really shapes how you look. Also for men too, but really, really for women given that social stigma. So let's go into kind of the types of hair loss. Often people will come into Kelsey and I and say, I have alopecia and I've been diagnosed with alopecia. Alopecia really is just the medical term for hair loss. So that just means I have hair loss. There are though lots of different medical types of hair loss. We really like to categorize that because it helps us find A, the cause, and B, the more specific solution. So as dermatologists, the way that we study and we categorize alopecia hair loss is as scarring and non-scarring. Those are the two broad categories of hair loss, scarring and non-scarring. Scarring is obviously a little bit worse. It means that every follicle is replaced with scar tissue tract so you will never grow hair in that area again. Non-scarring means that the hair follicle is preserved. It may be miniaturized, it may be shrunk, but it is still there, and we have a little higher likelihood of getting the hair back. Um, let's begin with non-scarring alopecia. The most common type of non-scarring alopecia is you know, what I've suffered from, something called female pattern hair loss. Also non-scarring alopecia is male pattern hair loss, kind of that classic male, you know, kind of receding backwards. But let's focus first on female pattern hair loss. So female pattern hair loss is due to um, uh, numerous factors, genetics, but also how our hair follicles respond to testosterone in the skin. Because women have both estrogen and testosterone, and if our hair follicles are just a little bit more sensitive to testosterone, specifically a type of testosterone called dihydroxytestosterone, we will start to kind of um, shed. And in women, it looks different than men. The frontal hairline is preserved, but we thin out more here than in the back. So that's kind of the characteristic of female pattern hair loss. What do you look for when you look for female pattern hair loss, Kelsey? I always make sure that I let my patients know that this actually does start for, for both males and females, but it does start in your mid-20s um, for a lot of people. Males can be a little bit earlier genetically, but females in particular, the mid-20s, and the first thing that people notice is that their ponytail gets smaller. Um, so you can wrap your ponytail around your hair more uh, easily or you can get it around one more time than you used to. Right. And that's because the very first thing that happens is not that we actually lose literal more hair or that there's fewer follicles growing. It's that the, the hair that is growing, the shaft of it, it starts to get smaller. The diameter gets smaller over time. So your hair gets finer, and that's the very first thing that happens. And that's one of those things that's really innocuous and you don't really think about it. Um, as an active type of hair loss, but that is the very first sign of that genetic aging type of hair loss. Right. There's, there are some scales that we actually use as dermatologists to categorize um, uh, the extent of the hair loss, um, the Norwood and the Hamilton hair loss. So, you know, it's characterized by kind of this widening of the part and then this frontal thinning. And, you know, obviously from all this, the ponytail gets, you know, thinner. So these are kind of the stages that one will go through. So let's go on. We'll talk all about treatments at the end. Let's talk about some other non-scarring types of hair loss. There's another um, actually very common type of hair loss we see that's not non-scarring called alopecia areata. I can find that photo of it. Do you want to talk about alopecia areata, Kelsey? Uh, Right oh, thank you. Um, Great. So alopecia areata um, is a type of autoimmune type of hair loss. Um, we don't always know exactly what causes it, but it's a combination of uh, genetic and environmental factors. And it usually shows up as these round, bald patches. Um, it can be uh, slow, but it can also be pretty sudden for some people. It is really common. Um, and it, some people will get one small patch 
Um, I see it in guys all the time, actually, when you're out at the grocery store, they'll have a patch in their beard or their hair um, that's pretty small, um, and a lot of guys don't even notice it. And you just happen to notice it on guys because they have shorter hair, but it is super, super common. And um, this is, you know, more easily treated for most people, and a lot of times your body takes care of it by itself um, without having to do anything with it. But if they get bigger, like that photo Dr. Treen just showed, um, it usually does take some medical intervention to get that to grow back for people. Sometimes that alopecia areata is associated with thyroid dysfunction. That's the most common kind of precipitating cause. I liken it to kind of like a pressure cooker. Like in some people, if you're under stress or something like that, that's the first thing to blow. You know, some people get ulcers, some people get depression, and some people they get their alopecia areata. So it's kind of a manifestation of stress or thyroid dysfunction and super treatable. You know, people get really concerned when they see these patches, but you know, oftentimes we can really get them back. Another type of hair loss we really commonly see is known as psoriasis associated alopecia or seborrheic dermatitis associated alopecia called psoriatic alopecia or dermatitis associated alopecia. What happens whenever we've got these inflammatory conditions of the scalp, it actually blocks the hair follicle growth. So you're not permanently losing that hair follicle, it's just kind of being blocked by all this inflammation. These are some of our most satisfying alopecia visits because just by using some topicals, maybe some injectable cortisone solutions, really the hair will come back and the patient will experience much less itching because these conditions can be really pretty itchy. So really treatable. If you have redness or flaking associated with your hair loss, please go to the dermatologist because you will see rapid, rapid improvement. Within four to six weeks, people see hair starting to grow. Yep. Um, let's move on to another really common type of hair loss that Kelsey and I have had after our children. It's called telogen effluvium. Do you want to talk about telogen effluvium, Kelsey? Yes. Yeah, so this, as we talked about, that telogen phase is that resting phase of your hair growth. And it's normal to have some of your hair in this phase. But when you get this condition called telogen effluvium, you have more than normal that are resting and not actively growing. This typically will show up as a, a more massive shedding event. And it can be bad enough, especially after uh, bearing children, after having your kids. Um, the, for women, I see mostly it's the temple area gets really thin after childbirth for a lot of people. So you can see kind of patches that get thin enough you notice it. Um, childbirth is a very common thing that this happens to, but it can happen with a lot of other stressful things on your body. Hospitalizations, car accidents. Uh, fever, nutritional yeah. deficiencies, fevers, um, and uh, very commonly seen after any sort of gastric surgeries as well uh, because your body is not as good at absorbing nutrients. Your body kind of uh, forgets about the hair for a while. Uh, the hair's like dormant, right? Yeah. No. So it's uh, your hair follicles are the last ones to get nutrition out of yeah. all the other cells in your body. So if you're getting a little nu uh, nutrient, deficient from gastric bypass surgery and such things, uh, it'll show up in your hair first. Right. right. So those are the most common types of non-scarring alopecia. So the you know female and male pattern hair loss, alopecia area, those brown patches and this telogen effluvium. Let's move on to scarring alopecia. Scarring alopecia is a little bit more serious. We consider it more of a, you know, we need to have some rapid intervention. So a really common type of scarring alopecia that people don't notice until later is something called frontal fibrosing alopecia. This is a type of hair loss where we lose the hair kind of in the headband distribution. So we get these patches in the front. It can sometimes mimic, you know, a female pattern hair loss because it does start there and kind of go backwards. But it, but it is, uh, you know, kind of a little bit more of an emergency. Frontal fibrosing alopecia is on the same spectrum as another condition called lichen planal pilaris. Can you take, take that off? Oops. <laughs> lichen so, planal pilaris is, sorry, go ahead, Kelsey. Oh, no, I was just going to say lichen planal pilaris is a type of, there's a, a skin condition called lichen planus, and when it shows up on the scalp, it says lichen planal pilaris. And it, it's, it's intense inflammation around those hair follicles. And you can see, usually, you do get this, you know, kind of redness. You get some scaling. And it's, it's all right around each individual hair follicle. 
Um, and sometimes this inflammation can be so intense that it does kind of permanently turn the hair follicle off. Right, and it's often um, associated with eyebrow loss too, guys. So that's something that we very commonly see. People don't notice, that they think that they're just aging or whatnot, and we're like, actually, that is a medical condition that needs to be treated, sometimes associated with little um, bumps uh, kind of on the temple as well, and can be intensely itchy. So definitely something that we can intervene and it should be intervened upon because otherwise people lose those follicles forever. Um, this is another uh, type of hair loss. It's called acne keloidalis nuki. It's one of our favorite hair losses to treat. It arises as these little inflamed hair follicles, typically around the back of the, the neck area, the nuchal area. Those hairs can ingrow and then they can kind of get scar-like and they can shed. So this can be really easily treated and we can get the people with hair back and their bumps better too. Those are some of our happiest patients, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Okay, now that we've talked about some of the most common types of hair loss, I think most of you wanna know about interventions because yeah. so many people, so many people go to the doctor or their primary or you know other dermatologists are just told, here's some Rogaine or there's nothing we can do. But I want you to know at Trained Dermatology, there are so many things we can do, especially since I suffer from hair loss and I know what it feels like to suffer from it and you can't think of anything else and you just start depressed every time you comb your darn hair. So Kelsey, you wanna talk about some of your favorite um, uh, blood work and supplements and things like that that you recommend? Yeah, so blood work is a really easy thing to check um, to see if you do have any minor nutritional deficiencies, any minor hormone imbalances, thyroid issues, or any sort of autoimmune um, markers in, that are show up in your blood work. Um, it's a really fast way to get a lot of information about the, the internal inflammation and things that could be contributing to hair loss. So that's, that's something that we do quite routinely. Um, the other thing that we may do on a first visit is do what's called a, a biopsy, where we, we take a section of the scalp and they send it in and what they, they literally count the hair follicles and look at exactly how, how many are in each stage. And I always tell my patients, it's a complicated algorithm that the pathologists have, yeah. um, but they, you know, they can very easily categorize people into scarring, non-scarring, and then help us decide what the root cause of it is. So those are two really important things to do right away, especially if you've seen other providers first and you know, been told like, ah, you're fine. Um, this is a, a, you know, an easy way to get an answer. Right, right, Kelsey's absolutely right. We think biopsies are key in hair loss because often you saw that frontal fibrosing alopecia. Oftentimes that's, it looks just like early female pattern hair loss or like that post baby telogen effluvium. So you don't really know until you get a picture of what's on the inside, you know. If you have like, you know, like a heart attack, you take a picture, you take an angiogram, same thing with your scalp. It's, a, it's the same thing. It really allows us to really determine the root cause. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, just uh, piggybacking on that blood work, often when you are prone to hair loss, as some of us are, if your levels are quote unquote normal, but they're on the low end of normal, if we supplement some specific parameters, you actually will get kicked back into growth phase because of us who are prone to hair loss, we need extra nutrition to get our hair to grow because our hair is what's called senescent. It's just a little bit kind of slower. So, you know, you may have been told, people tell us all the time, don't they, Kelsey? Oh, my primary took my blood work, it's normal. And then we review the levels and maybe we'll hyper supplement maybe vitamin D or your iron and then all of a sudden you'll get kicked into growth phase. We see it all the time and patients are so happy. Mm -hmm. It's a really easy thing to do. Really easy and it just supports your overall nutrition. There are a couple other supplements that we as dermatologists suggest. There's this great one that I take myself as well as our special guest star that you'll speak to in a couple of seconds, Miss Sarah over there. Um, so Viviscal is a marine kelp algae shark extract. Um, I think most dermatologists agree that it helps. We don't know to what extent it helps. In some people it helps a ton. In some people it doesn't help as much. I still take it because I see growth with it and we still recommend it. There's another really good one that's really inexpensive and available over the counter. It's something called Geracil. Geracil is silicone. And what that silicone does, it doesn't do anything to prevent hair loss or anything like that. It actually thickens the bulk of the hair. So when you're feeling so thin and so depressed as you know we all have in the past if we suffer from hair loss, it actually makes the caliber of your hair 
feel thicker and fuller, so it just, you know, makes it feel better in that ponytail. <laughs> I have a few patients who rave about this in terms of uh, being able to style their hair more easily. Yes. And it, it feels younger than it used to. It doesn't have that straw like, yep. you know, bleh. <laughs> We've all had our hair do that. Meh. Um, I, I don't I, believe that. Look at Kelsey's gorgeous <laughs> curls. I don't believe it, Kelsey. It's always hard to be counseled to about hair loss when somebody has like beautiful locks like coming down. So thank my mother for that. <laughs> Let's move on to um, a topical medicine called minoxidil. Minoxidil is a topical non-prescription, over-the-counter medicine. It comes in solution or foam. What minoxidil does, it prolongs the antigen phase, that growth phase that Kelsey was telling you about where most of our, 90% of our hair is in that growth phase. So as we age or for this female pattern hair loss or other types of hair loss, minoxidil helps prolong that growth in the follicle and so it doesn't shed as much. So it really is the fountain of youth for hair. They've done studies Minoxidil actually works better in women than in men. So people say to us all the time, I don't want to use my Minoxidil. And I'm like, why not? They're like, because I have to use it for the rest of my life. And I'm like, okay, well, hopefully you're wearing deodorant for the rest of your life. Hopefully you're using your, um, you know, Too Faced for the rest of your life. So this is something that we swear by. I, I have used my Minoxidil since I've been about 20 years old, and it just becomes a part of your habit. Um, and you don't have to buy the brand name one. You can buy the generic one. It works really well. Anything else you recommend with Minoxidil, Kelsey? Um, so I always let people know that it does come in the two formulations, the solution and the foam. I think the solution is easier to get on when you do have a little bit thicker hair, but uh, one of the most common side effects of Minoxidil is irritation. Some people will get itchy or rashy from it, and if that's the case, the foam is a lot less irritating. So if you found that you couldn't uh, tolerate Minoxidil in the past, try the foam version because most of my patients are able to tolerate the foam. Right, the foam doesn't have propylene glycol in it. So the foam doesn't have this allergen called propylene glycol, which is why it's less irritating. Um, let's move on to two other prescription medicines and then we want to talk about some procedures because we do have a special guest star to talk to. Um, so another medicine that I take myself is something called spironolactone. And we, just, we touched on this on Monday on our acne talk. Spironolactone blocks testosterone in the receptors in the skin. So it does not um, cause any hormonal imbalances internally. It just helps kind of, um, so your hair is not responding to so much of that testosterone. So it's a great medicine, very safe. There are some other parameters, obviously it would be prescribed to you, but it is something to help with um, many types of hair loss. Do you want to talk about finasteride? So finasteride is a medication that's FDA approved to treat male pattern hair loss. Um, it's been around for a long time. The brand name is called Propecia, and it does have a generic now, which is nice. Um, but this does, you know, similar to a lot of these other medications, it does help to block that um, uh, hormone receptor in the, the scalp. Mm -hmm. It is um, something that, that can have side effects, but most people do tolerate it really well. Um, and again, it's just, you know, one of those things you have to continue to take. I think that's the biggest thing is, is with all of this is that we don't have a cure for your hair loss, so everything that you do, you have to kind of keep taking it for it to keep working. For guys, um, I think part of the reason Rogaine doesn't tend to work as well for them is that they, they wait too long. Um, and the same goes for finasteride. If you wait until you're shiny bald, it's not gonna work great. Right. Um, so if it gets, starts getting to the point where your hair loss is bugging you, it's time to come in and talk about it. Um, there's a great statistic that I found. 90% of men will lose no more hair, will lose minimal to no hair after three months of starting Propecia. So it's a you know really effective medicine for our, our men. We don't use it as commonly in women because of side effects, but it is something Kelsey and I will use occasionally. Um, a couple other things we often do for hair loss, cortisone injections. We have a great before and after, if I can find it of um, cortisone injections. Cortisone injections help stimulate um, growth and reduce inflammation of the hair balls. Here, this is a gentleman that we did cortisone injections on for his hair loss, and it is just remarkable. He thought forever that he would never have any more hair, and it literally is just, you see him too, it's, just, it's so thick and it's, it's life-changing for him. Um, other things, simple things to do, Massage of the scalp, diet, getting enough protein, those things are really helpful. Massage just stimulates blood flow. But what I want to focus on now is something called PRP, 
platelet-rich plasma. Kelsey, do you want to do a little um, discussion mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, so they, uh, platelets therapy Here. has been around for a while. And um, it is, uh, it's been used in the orthopedic world for a long time and uh, more recently been used for things like anti-aging and hair loss. Uh, platelets are a particular type of blood cell um, and when they have found that when you inject them back into the scalp they help to stimulate kind of stem cell growth and they help to kind of turn back the clock on your aging skin cells. And the uh, PRP treatment that we do, it's, it's uh, all natural. So if there, <laughs> if there are people who are hesitant to take things that they don't know what they are, this is really nice. It's actually a blood draw that you do and uh, we spin it down. There's a particular procedure that we follow to get the most platelets out of your blood sample that we can. And then you re-inject them back into the scalp. And we've been seeing really good luck with this. Um, Miss Sarah here is one of our patients who very kindly offered to come in and give us um, her experience with the PRP. Um, Sarah, what were, what were, how, how was the treatment? Well, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Some is, some areas of your head does, doesn't hurt at all, mm -hmm. you know, especially with the vibrating thing you use. Yeah. There are areas like on the temple mm -hmm. that are a little bit more sensitive, but it's a split second. That's right. You know. I, how was your experience with the hair growth? It, well, it's amazing. I couldn't go out in the wind yeah. without having my husband rearrange my strands. To cover <laughs> up. And so I just am so deeply indebted to Dr. Tureen. Mm -hmm. Oh, stop. I wish I could give Sarah a hug, guys. But we are huggers. Like, you see so much volume here, and um, later on we'll post some of Sarah's before and after with our winners. But I hate to say it, you were so thin before, and yeah. we tried a lot of we things. We went through almost every step. Yes, yes. But the PRP has been magic for yeah. you. Yeah. Magic. And, it, you know, I've had PRP too because I suffer from hair loss too. And we both agree it's not the most fun five minutes of our lives. I am braver than you are. You are. <laughs> 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 um, I always have Kelsey do my PRP at, on Friday at 5 o'clock. I'm sure it is the best part of her week. <laughs> Look at all this volume, guys. And that's where PRP works. Ironically, PRP works the best in the front. You know, most Which things in life. really want. Yeah, most things in life, they work the best where you don't want them. I want you, you, you keep sitting, Sarah, but I want you guys to see, this is my mom. This is before. Look at the front of her scalp. Like, you, she had no hairs to cover. This is her after two sessions of PRP. Isn't that awesome? Look at that, That's Sarah. It's like, I'm so happy for her. I know, I know. You know, she's a doctor too, and it really just gives her so much more confidence. So this is one thing in life where it really gives you where you want it. I think that's it. Like you said at the beginning, it's, it's that lack of confidence when this happens to you. And I, I remember feeling very hopeless when I came in here. because I just moved to the area. I didn't know you, and it was just luck. And it was one day with you, and I just said, she'll take care of me. I <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so Sarah's done great with her PRP, and we just continue it periodically just to keep the growth phase up. She needs it less and less frequently. Yeah. But, I mean, it's crazy. Every time we do it, she keeps growing, and it keeps getting thicker. So, thank you. Um, and Sarah got a free PRP treatment from me today because we love her. So. <laughs> trying to eat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Awesome. So what time is it now? Should we take some questions from the audience? It's time. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Okay. We'll take like two, three questions, guys, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. In You're regards welcome. to niacin, whether that's over the counter or from the salon, does that supplement help with hair loss? So great question. Nioxin has never been shown in randomized control trials to help. Does it make the hair feel better? Yes, there is some theory that it increases some oxygenation to the hair follicles, but I do not recommend it from a randomized control study trial. Like if you wanna do it, great, it's not gonna hurt anything. Is it okay to use minoxidil if you have scalp psoriasis? Excellent question. Do you wanna take that, Kelsey? So I always recommend that we get the psoriasis under good control first, um, because most of the time, actually, that'll fix a lot of the hair loss that people are seeing. It does take time. Um, we forgot to mention, but everybody's hair growth cycle is somewhere between four and 12 weeks long. The older you get, the, the 
closer to that three month mark that it is. So even if your psoriasis is treated, it may take several months to notice the, the hair coming back. And so I don't usually recommend starting minoxidil until we know for sure the psoriasis is well controlled so you don't get irritated from things. And I have a family history of psoriasis, so I get little patches in my scalp occasionally. Just so you know, I agree with everything Kelsey said, but I still use my minoxidil, and if I need to, I put a little topical steroid right where my psoriasis patches are. Shannon is prescribed minoxidil in pill form for blood pressure. Is this the same? Yes, it's actually very, it's, it, the derivative is the same ingredient. The problem is with the dosage that's used in pill form, it actually can cause a lot of facial hair growth. When I was in, uh, an intern as doctors, we you know do all medicine, I saw a poor young lady, she was like 18 years old, she had terrible um, congenital heart defect and she was on oral minoxidil and she looked like a weird wolf. She had hair everywhere. So that's why we really prefer topical minoxidil because it can be targeted to the area. Should we do one more? Sounds good. All right, in regards to telogen effluvium, how long after a surgery or pregnancy would you expect to see this hair loss? So based upon the hair cycle growth, we usually see it within, within three to six months. If it's much more than six months, it's not telogen effluvium. What has happened is that your telogen effluvium has unmasked something else, more likely a female pattern hair loss. Perfect. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. So if you need an appointment, um, we are doing telehealth, so we are happy to see you for telehealth for your hair loss, and we'll um, post Sarah's before and afters and um, our five winners and our big grand prize winner on Monday. <laughs>